So that's Romania. So if you want to go, you know, have your kids take care of you, go to Romania. But if you don't want to move into Romania, it, you know, listen to what I'm telling you. Hey everybody, welcome to Building Wealth the Wheeler Way. Appreciate you guys being here. Today we got a pretty exciting topic to talk about. We're going to talk about uh, long life, short retirement. In other words, outliving our money. Ooh, it's scary. So maybe it's a horror, a horror podcast, right? What's the what's the what's a horror show, right? For finances, is outliving your money. Uh, so what does that mean? That means you are old, broke person. <laughs> And nobody wants to be that, right? So I'll say this. If your goal, if your retirement goal is to uh, achieve Medicaid, right, which means to get on Medicaid, you got to you gotta be broke, then you can stop watching now. Congratulations. But if your goal is, I don't want to be on Medicaid, then can continue to listen and uh, we'll jump right into it. So speaking of Medicaid, I want, to, I want to hit on a topic real quick. Here's a popular misconception with Medicaid, because when I, when I bring this up to uh, clients, they'll say, well, you know, if, even if I outlive my money, you know, we go through the retirement plan and all that. I'm not worried about outliving my money. What about Medicaid? Isn't the government going to take care of me? I mean, think about that statement. Isn't the government going to take care of me? Is that, is, is that the plan you guys want to live off of? But let's say that is. Let's say you do want to factor in Medicaid for your, you know, your future older self. Well, unfortunately, the way Medicaid works is you got to be broke two years before you need it. So what, what does that mean? That means that you can't be richy rich. You can't be Mr. and Mrs. Daddy Warbucks, right, uh, up until the day, you know, they want to Medicaid and you go, you say, I'm going to give all my money to my kids or I'm going to give all my money uh, to charity or whatever it is. And you know what? I've been paying taxes all this all this time. The government should take care of me. I'm going to go off of Medicaid. The government says, okay, you could do that. You can give all your money away, but then we're going to go back dating it, right, to when, when what you should have, what, what you would have been like if you were would have been broke a while back. What does that mean? It means they're going to keep, char- you won't be able to qualify for Medicaid until all of that money would have run out for at least five years, right? So you got to be broke long before, right? You got to you gotta have no money long before you actually need Medicaid. And that's the trick because nobody knows when they're really going to need Medicaid. I mean, how many of you are sitting there now going, you know what? I want to be on Medicaid at age 88. I'm, gonna, I'm planning for that, right? And so at 83, I'm going to start giving my money away. It just doesn't work. So I would caution you guys, you know, I always run into some guys out there who are maybe trying to game the system or really smarter than they really maybe are. I always tell people, listen, that's how they got Al Capone, taxes, right? The government, when it comes to money and giving out benefits, where do you think those benefits come from? They come from taxes. So anything that has to do with taxes and the government, they're going to win. Right. There's no gaming. There's no gaming that system. Don't believe the news that there's all these rich people getting away with stuff and for the everyday American, for you and me, no, Medicaid is not where you want to be. So please don't use that. I just want to talk about that up front. Please don't have that as your fallback, right? You don't want to, you don't want to be in a center block uh, state-owned nursing home in El Paso with a roommate named Marge that smoked her whole life, cough, and, and, and has a couple alcoholic kids coming down the road. You, you don't want that. That's what Medicaid is, right? Who wants that? So anyway, I want to get through that. So Let's, let's talk about a few examples of, of, of some other people that maybe ran into some trouble. Um, I had one lady came to me, wanted to become a client, and she, she, had, she even worked for an insurance company, and she'd saved enough money for retirement, so she thought, so she planned out, and had maybe about two, three hundred grand, say, let's say three hundred grand saved up, I think, is what she had. Um, and she had the house, she had the expenses down, but she, she made the mistake of planning for her retirement kind of how I said not to do in the past, as if everything is going to be roses and rainbows every year of retirement from the age 65 until you die. Well, guess what happened? It wasn't roses and rainbows. Her husband, who was relatively young, wound up having dementia. And so she had just retired. He got dementia, and she put him in a health facility to care for because she didn't she couldn't care for him or didn't want to or a combination thereof who, who knows but bottom line is she put him in a home let's call it um but that was an expensive home it was about six grand a month right and so between his social security and uh what she was paying 
she couldn't afford it. It was something like six grand she was paying a month. So she starts eating out of her 401k that she had saved up to pay for her retirement. And so now she's in the red every month, four or five grand. Think about that. You're 65 years old and you're losing money to the tune of four to five grand a month. And I'll do the math for you. That's 60 grand a year, 60 grand net, $60,000 a year going away that you can't, you, what's your choice at that point? How are you going to go earn? To make 60 grand, you got to go get a job for 100 grand after taxes and everything, right? Not so easy for a 65 year old woman to do to just go back to work and go get another $100,000 job. So now what? So now she's faced with, well, bringing the husband back home, trying to get the daughter to help. So now we're in a whole nother dynamic, right? Not just financial stress, but mental stress behind that. The family dynamic changes now. The child, the, the daughter, the 40-year-old daughter now is not so happy that she's having to take care of her father and, and take from her life, right, to go do that. So in essence, they're becoming a burden to their children. One, one thing I hear from clients all the time, I don't want to be a burden to my children. And then they don't plan accordingly, though, and then they wind up doing what? being a burden to their children. Uh, and right or wrong, that's how our society is. Some societies, you know, when I was in uh, Romania, it's funny, I was in Romania a couple of years ago, uh, giving a seminar, and they and the Romanians like, Wheeler, this 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 long term care thing, this taking care of parents, this this is this is meaningless to us. I said, Well what do you mean? I mean how, how do you guys how do you guys take care of uh, when you get old, what, what are you gonna do? How, how are you gonna take care of yourself? We don't take care of ourselves. The way we do it is the youngest child is their job to take care of the parents. The youngest child gets to stay with us and live with us in our apartment or our home or whatever it is his entire life or her entire life. And the social contract is, is that when we need help and care, since we paid for them to live there in their adulthood, that they're going to continue to pay and support us now. And in terms of the inheritance, if, if they have brothers and sisters, we don't, you know, we, we divvy the house up and say, okay, we're gonna, if we have four kids, all four of you are going to get 25% of our estate or our house or whatever. But the social contract there is that the other three siblings are going to turn around and give it right back to that youngest son or just deny it or daughter and say, because you're taking care of our parents, we forego our part of the estate, and there you go. So that's Romania. So if you want to go, you know, have your kids take care of you, go to Romania. But if you don't want to move into Romania... It, you know, listen to what I'm telling you. You kind of have to save for your financial self and do so in a way that there's going to you get you leave, you leave yourself some room for error for those things that happen. Age happens, sickness happens. You got to allow for that. And of course, there's you know insurance plans and things like that uh, that we'll get into later on. I don't want to get down into the weeds. I just want you to mentally, you know, conceptually understand that you kind of have to oversave for retirement probably more than you think. And do so in a way as your older self. Your older self is going to re require more money. Um, I'll tell you, another, another person I talked to, um, really well off. They moved here from California, and that's a big thing. Uh, all, the, all the Californians are moving here from, uh, moving from California here to Texas. Um, made really, both her and her husband made six figures, right? But the mother had health issues. And, and due to their six figure life and, you know, they're making over 200 grand a year and they're living that 200 grand a year lifestyle, even coming from California and things are cheaper in Dallas, but you know, they just bought bigger in Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. So instead of downsizing coming from California, they just upsize. And so now they're paying for more stuff. The mother gets sick. They have no um, plan for that. And so now this 60 year old woman and her 65-year-old husband are having to take care of their 80 or 89, 90-year-old, I think she's 90 now, 90-year-old mother, and now they can't retire, right? Think about that. You're making over 200 grand a year as a couple, probably even well over that. Um, you're in your 60s, and you still can't retire because your mom didn't plan or you didn't plan for your mother uh, and, and her needs, right? So those are the things you got to think about. Uh, in terms of retirement. And again, I know it's not sexy and cool to think about it when you're 30. Guess what? It's not sexy and cool to think about it when I'm 49. But if you don't, it for sure isn't going to be sexy and cool when I'm 65 and 70 and still having to work or still having to take care of either my spouse or my mother or my father still alive that I didn't plan for. So it, another example when you're not taking life to an account is, you know, I, I know kids, you know, there's a lot of couples out there because of medical 
technology are able to have kids later in life. My wife and I are no exception. You know, we we had kids later in life. Um, I've got the twin seven year old daughters. I'm 49. So guess what? The chances of me retiring at 60, right? So they're going to be 18 when I'm 60. What do you think two 18 year old girls are going to want to do when they're 60? You think they're going to come visit uh, mom and dad in the retirement home, right? Do you think they're going to be okay with you know me saying, hey, good luck? Best of luck to you. I mean, there are people who do that. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to prepare your kids for that and you say, hey, you, I got you till the 18, and after you're 18, you're on your own. Nothing wrong with that. That's not how I'm going to do it for my girls, though. So um, since that's the case, guess what? I'm going to have to pay for probably a couple of cars. That's just the nature of the society we live in. The buses don't come up to where I live, right? So I'm going to have to pay for a couple of cars because I don't have to drive around. I'm not going to be a chauffeur for my daughters at, at – uh, at 18, I'm pretty sure they're not going to want their 60 year old dad driving them on dates, right? Or whatever it is. So I got a couple of cars I got to pay for. Hopefully, college. And college is going to look, maybe that'd be a podcast in the future, what college will look like. I think it's going to look a lot different. But there will be some form of higher education that I'm going to have to pay for, right? Be it an emboldened trade school, be it a college. And so I'm going to have to pay for that. Weddings, pretty sure they're probably going to get married, maybe, hopefully. I don't know if that's their choice life partnership, whatever, there's going to be some ceremony where I'm going to have to pay a ton of dough for a party for a bunch of people I don't like and don't know to eat all my food, drink all my booze, and then leave, right? But I'm not going to have to do that once. I'm going to have to do it twice. The truth is, I've already done it twice. I'm married twice. So now that's four weddings. <laughs> I'm going to have to pay for four weddings. Uh, so I'm probably not, my point is, I'm not going to be able to retire at 60 because I, life happened and I'm going to have to stage that out. Um so, again, you just got to consider the psychological impact of that type of thing. You got to be ready for your older self. Give your older self a chance. You know, that's all I'm saying. Give your older self a chance. Make an emergency financial aid kit for your older self. You know, these, those old timeshare things that they used to bury in the ground in the first grade, and then you pull it up in, in high school and see pictures of yourself. Do that for your financial. I'm not saying go put 12 grand in the backyard like Cousin Eddie in Vegas vacation, right? But I'm saying do that plan and mentally make your house, your financial house, put it in order that you have accounts set aside, retirement accounts, savings accounts, whatever, and a methodology in place where you're contributing to those so your older self can have that can have that cushion that they'll need, right? Because you're going to need it. Um, I'll share some some numbers with you. If you're a female now, they say 85% of females today will need long-term care, right? So that's it's kind of like smoking. It used to be when you when smoking in the 70s or 60s, cancer wasn't really associated with it. You know, there's some light talk about it. Uh, but now pretty much we know if you smoke, you're going to get cancer. Yeah, there's one or two out there that don't. But for the most part, if you smoke, you're going to get cancer. So right now, if you're a healthy female, you are going to need long-term care, Right. And so the average stay for long-term care, and we're not just talking nursing home, we're talking people coming to your house, helping you out, that type of thing, and nursing home care, whatever. The average stay is two and a half years. That's two and a half years. Now, what's the average cost? The average cost could be, in today's dollars, anywhere from $2,500 a month for the low end. Hey, I got Marge, my roommate, in El Paso, center block, you know, the lonely on floors, white toast for lunch, and oatmeal, you know, very bare bones minimum, right? Just as hair above Medicaid, twenty five hundred dollars a month, right? Twenty five hundred dollars a month for that, all the way up to twelve thousand dollars a month for the full blown. Hey, I want a massage every day. I want a four course gourmet meal. Uh, I want movies. I want a golf course. That you know. So there's a big range in there. So the first thing I can figure out is okay, what what, where do I fit in? Where do I want to fit in? But even before that, even on the low end, you're going to be paying about. One hundred to three hundred thousand dollars on the low end in long-term care costs if you're a female today. And so, for you young twenty-six-year-olds out there, uh, you know, following, you know, keeping up with the whoever's or whatever the you know the Instagram, you know, do yourself a favor, do your own Instagram post and show people, you know, if you want to be a social influencer, show them you saving for your long-term care for when you're eighty, and then fast forward to when you're eighty, whatever whatever the social influencer of the time is. You can be making it rain as an 80-year-old in long-term care, right? So please do that. Please start having a plan. The sooner you think about it, the cheaper it'll be for you and the easier it'll be to save. Uh, but again, that is the number one killer. And for men, the stat is just something like six months. Men tend to die faster, sooner. Uh, 
maybe the argument is they're just not as careful with themselves, with their bodies as women are. They're not as conscious about it. But that's the stats, right? So for men, long-term care, yeah, you need about six months to a year. Um, and it's so funny. Every time I have a conversation about what the long-term care plan is for a couple when they come down, immediately the man will be like this because they think I'm trying to sell them something, right? Sitting like this, frowny brow. The woman kind of leans forward and kind of listening. And the man will say, we don't need long-term care. I say, okay, well, what's your plan? And I'll look at the, at the spouse, typically the wife, and I'll say, what's your plan when – Jim here dies. Guess who starts talking? Jim. Jim starts telling the plan, boy. Well, we're going to blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, hold up. Time out. Jim, guess what, buddy? You're dead. You're dead. In this scenario, you're dead. Guess what dead people don't do? Dead people don't talk, Jim. So you're dead. You're out of this picture. Now, Mrs. Jim, what are you going to do? Guess what happens every time? Mrs. Jim has no clue. No answer. Nothing. Right? So please have that discussion sooner than later. Don't, don't be Mr. and Mrs. Jim without a plan. Because uh, guess what? Jim don't care. Jim's going to be dead, right? So please take that into account. So this brings us to the, the outliving my money. Okay, you're like, okay, Wheeler, I haven't really saved up a lot of money. I'm worried. I've done the Wheeler Wealth Formula. I'm worried I'm going to outlive my money. Okay, don't stress. There's a couple things that we didn't take into account that we can, that we can look at. Uh, the first one is, right, we can, if you haven't retired yet, we can work longer. Not fun, I know, but that's a choice. So you work longer, bear down, grin and bear it, work longer, right? Or, you know what, you can recalibrate your retirement. Maybe you had a really nice retirement plan and you're going to fall short. So rework your retirement plan and maybe not have as nice of a retirement Right, I, I would love to say be able to eat your cake and eat it too, but in this case, if you still want to retire at the same age, um, and you don't have enough money to do so, then you're just going to have to retire a little, a little less nice. Maybe not live in as nice of a home. Maybe not have as nice of a long-term care plan. Maybe not have as nice of a car. Maybe not travel as much as you wanted to. Maybe not have as much money as you wanted to give to your grandkids for college or or whatever that looks like. Right. So you're going to have to do that. Or the third thing is earn more money. And again, we've talked about that. That's going to be hard. That's the fallacy that most of you are going to fall into. You're going to like, I'll just earn more money. Uh, when you're older, it's going to be very hard to do that because you're going to be, you're just going to have that much energy and you're really not going to work, want to work a side, a side hustle. I mean, has anybody ever looked at the 70 year old woman behind the Whataburger counter and said, Ooh, I can't wait to be her one day, right? Doubtful. So, you know, that's just not reality. So either work longer or, or dumb down your retirement a little bit. One other thing we can talk about is Social Security. There is a way you can work some number and earn some more money with Social Security that a lot of people don't know about. Um, and you're like, oh, okay, we have Social Security. We're not going to have Social Security. The government's spending all my money. So-and-so's in the White House. They're going to Listen, you, you got to stop all that noise. I've been through every so-and-so in, in the White House. None of them are any good, right? None of them care about your retirement. So get that, get that mentality, that victim mentality, get it away. Just, just forget that. Don't even, don't even associate White House politics with your retirement. Okay, forget it. Here's the thing, though, with Social Security, here in the near term, it is going to be there, right? I can get many reasons for it. Um, I don't want to get down to the weeds, but it's going to be there. One reason is it's the baby boomers. There's a lot of baby boomers out there, and they, they vote. Okay, do you think they're going to vote to not have Social Security? No. Okay, so chances are it's going to be there for the short term. Then you go down to the millennials, also the biggest voting block. They vote. Do you think they're going to vote to not get any money? Probably not. Okay, so the question to me is not is Social Security going to be there? It's, it is what is it going to look like when I get there, when you get there, right? Because here's the thing, it does get taxed. And, and if you make, I forget what the numbers, if you make over $44,000, you're going to be having to take money from your retirement. You will be making money because some of you have 401ks. You're going to be having to take out of that. That's going to count as income. The government's going to tax that. And then your Social Security is going to be counted as tax too. And long story short, about 85% of your Social Security is going to be taxed. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't think that their Social Security is going to be taxed. It will. And so right now, that's what it looks like. If you make over a certain amount of money, I think it's $44,000 as a married couple, then 85% of your benefits are going to be taxed. So the numbers don't matter. They're, they're going to change. The, the, what matters is to remember is that Social Security will be taxed. Right now, you can, you can get Social Security at 62, 
right? And so what I see people doing is, oh, I can't wait to get that money. I have been paying into Social Security my whole life, this FICA guy, whatever it is. By God, I'm going to get my money. I think, you know, I, I don't want to outlive it too. I don't want to die early and then not get my money back. Please don't do that. I, I, it's mostly guys that do that. They do this calculation. They get the spreadsheet out and like, okay, if I take it at 62, I know it's a reduced benefit versus full retirement age. But then if I die at 75, I'm not getting all my money back, blah, 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 blah. It never works out. Again, we talk about, you don't know what life's going to throw at you. You're not God. Even if you don't believe in God, unless you plan on committing suicide on the day that you plan you're going to die, there's no way you're going to know when you're going to die. You've got to plan to live longer than you are. And let's say you even do that. Let's say you do do that. I always tell them, what about your wife? What about your spouse, your significant other, right? They never factor them in. They never factor them in, right? And because when they die, some of their benefit goes to their spouse. So please don't do that math. Please don't try and take your Social Security early. Here's another reason not to do it. If I was a social, if I, you know, as a financial advisor, if I told you I could guarantee you an 8% return every year, no matter what, market goes up, down, war with Russia, no war with Russia, whatever, 8%, no matter what, you got $100 in there now every year for the next eight years, it's going to go up 8%. Would you go with me? Would you care what investment it was? Would you, would you ask me lots of questions? No, you guys would jump on that. Would you care how much I was charging you? Probably not. I could charge you 10 as so long as you netted eight. You'd be happier than pig and slop. You'd date that all day. We didn't even talk about what it was, right? So I'm assuming the answer is yes, right? You'd be crazy not to take that deal. This is what the government is doing in Social Security. They're telling you that if you wait to take Social Security until the age of 70, your monthly benefit, we're going to increase it every year by 8%. Every year by 8%. So, I mean, that may not seem like a lot of money, but let's say you've got 3000 If you retire at full retirement age, they're going to give you $3,000 a month, right, full retirement age. But if you wait another, you know, few years till you're 70, and it's going to go up 8% each year, now that, that 3000 now that's more like 4000 4000 a month for the rest of your life. And you may be asking, well, why is the government doing that? Well, the first thing I would say is who cares why the government's doing it? But if you want to get into it, I'll tell you why. Because there is a problem with Social Security. Yes, it is underfunded. And so they're incentivizing you to keep it in there longer. So it's in there growing. They have a bigger pool of money, and it's growing longer. But most people don't know that. So if you're short of retirement money, you're short of your retirement goal, and you're coming up on 65, and your initial thing is to say, well, I'm going to start taking my Social Security. I'm telling you, don't. I'm telling you, don't. I'm saying start taking from your 401k and your savings first, right? Maybe continue to work, hopefully. And if you have to take from your savings, take from it and leave your Social Security alone for as long as possible. Try to make it to your 70 because they only do it until your 70 and then turn it on, right? Now, there's a few exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, for 95% of you out there listening to this, that's going to make sense. So I definitely want to talk. And you know what? If you go to Social Security uh, office, you're not going to get a lot of help there, right? It's kind of like the DMV. You either know how to drive or you don't. They're not going to sit there and teach you. So it's the same with Social Security. You either want your benefit or you don't. They're not going to go through the math for you. So you really pays to talk to a professional, uh, pays to do your own research. But even if you want to do that, you're not going to make a big mistake by leaving your Social Security in there until you're 70 years old. That's an 8% guaranteed return every year. So that's one thing you can do if you're falling short. Please do that. Okay, so let's get to the topic that we talk about with, okay, I'm sure I hear what you're saying about Social Security. I'm going to do that, but I'm still a little light. I still did the Wheeler Wealth Formula. I'm still light. I did dumb down my retirement. It's not going to be as nice. So what do I do? Well, I hate to tell your brothers and sisters, but at that point, you're going to have to work. You continue to do the job that you're doing for another few years or get you a side hustle. And I think we had another podcast that talked about some side hustles out there. Even for the older generation now, it's easier to do a side hustle with the technology that's out there. I would say even besides technology, and I'm not talking about, you know, doing a DoorDash. That's something you could do. Um, working at Whataburger, that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's out there, but... You know, some, at some point over the last 30 or 40 years, so if you're 60 years old out there listening to this, you have built up an expertise of whatever that is. And there's somebody out there, whatever niche that is, that's willing to listen to what that expertise is. You just have to monetize that. And the Internet is a great way to do that. 
And again, this is not a podcast to tell you how to do that. There's plenty of you Google how to earn money when I'm older. A lot of stuff will pop up for you. But think about, don't discount yourself. Don't beat yourself up saying, hey, I don't have anything I can offer at 60 years old. I don't have anything I can offer at 70. You do. There's a lot of things out there that are consulting, especially on the internet, right? You can consult somebody on how to sell something, on how to buy something, on how to build something, on how to teach something. Um, you know, basically, you can become a teacher right there to the, to the younger generation from the comfort of your own home. That's one way you can do that. That's a nice little side hustle you can have. But... Um, there's also things you can do as far as catch-ups and retirement accounts. People don't understand that. Again, the numbers will change. So I'm not going to, you know, dive down into the numbers. But um, as one example, prior to the age uh, 50, you can put up to $19,500 into a 401k. After age 50, you can bump that up to like $26,500. And that's just in a 401k. If you're self-employed, your number also increases. You have also a, a way to do what's called catch-up contributions. So if you don't understand what those are, you know, Google catch-up contributions and a lot of stuff will come up. I would prefer you talk to a professional because each situation is different, but they'll be able to tell you, hey, if you're 50 years old or older, here's some other ways you can store money away tax-free or tax-deferred. But nine times out of 10, people are not taking full advantage of that. They're still going off the old math thinking they were limited and they didn't understand that they could put more in. Another example is prior to 50, you could put up to six grand into a Roth IRA. After 50, you can put up to seven. Okay. Here's another trick that most people don't know about. It's called a spousal IRA. Let's say uh, you work and your spouse doesn't. Well, your spouse doesn't have a 401k. The government realizes that, so they allow them to have a IRA. It could be a traditional or a Roth. So right away, there you go. There's another six grand that you can start putting away. So if you and your spouse are both over the age of 50, now that's another that's another seven grand that you can start putting away tax deferred and saving up for retirement. So there's little things like that you can do to kind of to trick the system, so to speak, that a lot of people don't know about um, to save money and kind of make up that gap if you think you're going to be falling short. So again, it's, 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 it's falling short what, what worries you. I tell you, you got to rethink your retirement a little bit. That's where we first start. Hey, am I, is my retirement not realistic? Okay. And again, entitlement's going to come at you. <coughs> entitlement's going to come at you. You got to fight that. You got to be realistic, right? Um, don't be afraid to re-enter the workforce, right? You're just, it's, there's about 1.5 million retirees re-entering the workforce. Now, there's two things about that number. One, it means that's 1.5 million people who were not prepared to retire. That's probably more what that number represents. However, part of that number represents some of those people probably wanted to keep working because they enjoy what they're doing. So if you're coming up on retirement and you think you're going to be short, start looking at what you like to do and can you get paid for it? Um, and it doesn't have to be mega dollars, right? It can be something like, you know, I like to paint. And will, and will they, you know, will they pay for me to paint little paintings at, at, at craft shows or something like that? Um, I like to garden. And there's a lot of people in Dallas who don't want to get out in a 100-degree heat and, and garden and put flowers in flower beds and stuff like that. Maybe that's something you could do. It's not, not, not what I would want to do. Again, I would, I, would look more toward, I would look more toward the mentoring thing as the older I am. Um, but I would, definitely, I would definitely look at doing something ahead of time for a side hustle that can take you through that retirement, that, that can get you over the hump to your goal. Um, here's one interesting fact that uh, men tend to die within the first 10 years of retirement. And when they looked at that, the reason for that is, is that they didn't have a purpose or a goal, right? Women, I don't know what the statistic is there, right? So I don't want to misquote something. But in essence, the concept is the same for both men and women that if you don't have a goal or something to work for in your older years, um, you tend to lose what's ho you know lose hope, lose a purpose, a sense of purpose of life, and then you tend to die sooner. So what I would tell you is when you're planning, you're doing your retirement plan, don't just talk about the fun stuff, right? Like, oh, I'm going to go off every day, I'm going to be on my boat, I'm going to be fishing, I'm going to be hunting. Yeah, you can only do that for so long. You really can. And, and I won't get into it, but I've had experience in that too where I've, you know, I was able to do what I wanted to for as long as I wanted to, play golf where I wanted to, eat at whatever restaurant I wanted to. You know what? After three or four years, that got boring, right? If you don't have a purpose, right, it's going to get boring. It may, it may shock somebody, especially you younger ones. Like, oh, if I have a lot of money, then I'm not going to get bored. I'll be great. Yeah, for a while. 
But if you don't have a sense of purpose, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose the will to live, honestly, especially when you're older. So it doesn't necessarily have to be work. It can be a hobby. It can be, um, you know, church activities, something mentoring, whatever helps you smile when you get up in the morning. Think about that as your older self, and if you do that, that will also you know, shorten your retirement plan because in essence, you're not working. You're doing something that you like to do and you plan for your retirement accordingly. And now you're able to live a nice retirement with purpose. So I hope this episode helped you. Can't wait to see you guys next time. Thank you. I'm really excited for you guys to join in with us next time. I have a guest host who is an entrepreneur. It's going to come in and kind of talk about how to live your life free and, and not die broke.